Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Thursday, December 12th, 2019, meet, uh, Planning Board Workshop Meeting, Town of Scarborough, Maine. If everyone can join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. <clears throat> And Jamel, can you do the roll, please? <coughs> sure. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dupree? Hendrickson? Here. Mr. Bealy? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Ms. Ladd? Here. Mr. Mine King? Here. And Ms. Saunders? All right. Uh, the records show that <clears throat> Rick Mine King will be a voting member this evening. All right. First item and only item on the agenda this evening is Crossroad Holdings LLC request a master plan review for the town center residential neighborhood within the downs. Come on. Okay. Thanks, I'll kick it off, I think. Um, so the applicants in front of the board this evening uh, to continue the review of the conceptual master plan for the town center residential neighborhood at the downs. So the applicant was last before you all in October uh, for the first review of the master plan. And since then, uh, town staff and the development team uh, have met to discuss the overall plan and details to help inform uh, this resubmission package. So the applicant has provided a refined uh, package for tonight, including updated plans, uh, proposed street designs, and updated space and bulk standards. Um, so staff has provided several comments about the proposed space and bulk regulations that suggested uh, further refinement uh, prior to final approval. Just a reminder, the master plan is intended to help understand the proposed scale of development and types, and the materials uh, did not seem to define the lower, moderate, and higher densities uh, proposed within the project. So the board should discuss these density ranges uh, this evening. Staff recognizes that the applicant is depicting uh, right-of-ways within the easterly portion of the project. The delineation of streets um, is not shown like they are throughout the rest of the project. So staff has recommended uh, that these plans depict interconnected streets within this portion of the project. The applicant also included the proposed street designs uh, and, updated, and an updated connectivity plan uh, that shows the different types of streets uh, with this submission. So the board should be able to, to discuss these street designs and the overall street network with the applicant this evening. And finally, staff has continued to recommend the applicant provide at least a 100-foot buffer adjacent to the riparian zone along the Willowdale Brook to help preserve and maintain the health of the stream. It was unclear to staff this buffer, um, the, uh, the length of the buffer uh, based on the materials. So the applicant should just be sure to discuss that with the board as well. And there's a host of other review comments from the memo provided. Uh, these are really the main elements identified for discussion purposes. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamal. Rocky or Dan? Dan's gonna get us started, thanks. <clears throat> I'm going to jump up here. Um, uh, thank you all, and I know this is a certainly a busy time of year, so I really appreciate, <coughs> in particular, the board kind of being out on an off night um, and, and discussing uh, this updated master plan uh, with us. Um, so thank you in particular for that, and um, thanks to staff for having a, a meeting with us. Since our last uh, presentation to you, we had a good department-level meeting uh, with Jay, Jamel, and other key staff to kind of talk through um, design details of this master plan. Uh, I thought I'd do a kind of a PowerPoint presentation to show you the updated plan since our last discussion. Also kind of walk through um, the, um, the plan development requirements and how we believe we're kind of meeting those requirements. Um, I can talk about staff comments that we recently received and how we are addressing them um, this evening and, and can in the future. There's also, uh, you know, with the master plan, it's there's a lot of material that is also informing what's going to be reviewed in the future at subdivision. So uh, we want to kind of talk about some of those things because there's only so far we can really kind of go before we do some hard engineering to answer some of these uh, questions and to kind of move the process along. I'll give you an update on the status of the state permitting and. Um, we had been hoping for approval this evening so that we can proceed further with addressing uh, some of these comments that are uh, many are kind of more at the, 
the subdivision level. So we wanted to kind of talk about to the board about um, approval and, and maybe conditions of approval and next steps. So just to orient everybody, uh, I know most, if not all of you, were at our last um, presentation, but this is the obviously the overall Scarborough Down site that you're quite familiar with at this point. Um, Nick rotated it just to keep everybody on their toes. So um, north is actually up here and, and Route 1 is down here. The area in orange is the area that we're talking about this evening um, for this town center residential master plan area. Um, and in terms of, you know, as you come in from Route 1, it's essentially just north of the first phase of the project, the first res mixed residential phase that's here. And it's, it's really just south of the grandstand, um, the inner and the outer track. Um, so as you drive into the site from Route 1, it's as the trees kind of open up and, and you look towards the grandstand. So we provided some updates um, since the last submission and also um, in just recently on the last few days uh, on this plan in response to staff comments. Um, one is regards to well, let me kind of back up and just kind of orient you again. So the, the proposal is to have a mixed residential um, neighborhood with interconnected streets and um, to kind of build on the wetlands and the conservation area that's on the northern end of phase one and to really focus development along the Downs Road, which is about here. Oh, did I say build on? Yeah. Okay. I'll slow down. <laughs> Not build on. No. The Downs Road is here, so um, add some some level of development along the Downs Road before it opens up into uh, this area, um, and then uh, create a gridded uh, neighborhood that that really uh, transitions from say higher density along uh, the the new Downs Road. The Downs Road would be realigned kind of go off alignment here to go to the west um, to create a more kind of cohesive neighborhood to the east of the Downs Road. Um, really along the Downs Road, it's going to be the primary street. Um, that's where we're envisioning more kind of multifamily townhouse um, and has been talked about with the board and staff. If there's going to be some light commercial, which we would love to see, maybe some small office, maybe some small retail that um, could be viable here. We would we would see that along the Downs Road in this area that's kind of in darker red and we added that category um, since we received staff comments before we said here, it could be here or here. It could be a whole along the entire corridor. Um, from a kind of transect or density standpoint, um, we're envisioning that uh, the housing types and density kind of taper from more multifamily and townhouse um, attached type housing along the Downs Road to um, cottages, to single family, to duplexes to the east. Really kind of being from kind of red, <laughs> being more uh, attached and more dense to less dense being kind of the yellow um, towards the Sawyer Road neighborhood. There's also that 100 foot buffer to the Sawyer Road neighborhood. So we've added kind of housing type categories to, to this diagram. Um, to, to, illustrate, um, to illustrate that. Another change and update is we're getting to know more about the soils and the suitability um, for stormwater. And um, based on additional analysis, we're planning on doing a gravel wetland feature in this central park area um, because that's the best location for that type of stormwater um, and stormwater in general. And um, we're pretty excited about that. DEP is excited about it from a treatment standpoint. I think the gravel wet wetland is the, the best um, and can provide the highest level of treatment considering the, the project and the watershed that we're in. So, um, and Nick is working hard on designing that into the project in a, in a way that can be a focal point. The other staff comment that's addressed on this diagram here is these are the sections of street that we hadn't shown a roadway in. Um, the intent was not to ever 
not to suggest we weren't going to build those, but rather phase it while the outer track is still in operation. So, um, but ultimately, uh, when the outer track is no longer necessary, um, then that road will be interconnected. So it'll have an, no dead end roads, interconnected streets. Another update uh, that we made since the last meeting on our um, infrastructure plan and phasing plan, we've identified where there is over overhead power, which is along the Downs Road to handle the three-phase power that's out there today and necessary um, to serve the project, particularly the commercial aspects of the project to the north of this area. And then from there, we've illustrated where it power goes underground and serves the neighborhood, the remainder of this phase in this neighborhood. Um, this plan also shows an initial idea around phasing, um, being the, the in initial kind of major phase would be in TAN. We anticipate there's going to be kind of sub-phases um, within each block, and that's driven by stormwater and by uh, the sewer shed and where uh, this portion of the project can be served heading towards Route 1 by sewer, which dictates uh, in part this phasing plan. And then this area in green would be a later phase, um, have its independent stormwater uh, treatment, and would be served um, likely by a future pump station up here or through other means in terms of sewer, but would not be served towards Route 1. <coughs> Um, we thought it would be helpful to kind of walk through the, the various plan development standards. So that's what we've used as kind of the guidance around um, what our design intent with the master plan, the kind of the level of detail we're trying to get to with the master plan, um, and how we believe we, we meet the plan development standards. Um, mixed use is the first requirement, and that's something that um, can be provided um, district-wide, meaning the entire downs but also is, you know, where possible desirable um, within each plan development. So this is a mixed residential um, community in, in phase, so it's mixed use in terms of different housing types. Um, we do hope to integrate those like commercial uses um, in, in a few places, as I outlined, um, but as I think the Planning Board's well aware this is also part of a much larger project that already has um, commercial activity in the Innovation District and we're excited to be kind of starting to think about the town center next. So um, within and district-wide, uh, we believe this is a meeting that mixed-use standard. Um, the other, the next standard is kind of overall location pattern of development um, and needing to be consistent with our site analysis. Um, and this is the site analysis that we did earlier this year, um, and this is that area um, shown as, a, as an appropriate development location. <coughs> so consistency there. Um, public water, uh, having an interconnected looped uh, system. Um, we've been pretty deliberate about having that interconnected street system. This shows the um, that street system and also the infrastructure plan. So the public water system is going to be within the street system and it's going to be interconnected. We're starting conversations with the water district on the details of that and we'll do more through subdivision. Uh, in terms of open space, um, there's a 10% open space requirement. We're going to be kind of well beyond that with the combination of open space that we're providing in this phase. Um, and we've been thinking a lot about how it relates to other phases of the project. So, um, you know, in the brown color is kind of the wetland areas that is going to be an open space contiguous with um, the, the open space in phase one. Um, also, uh, the Willowdale corridor has a conservation easement on it, um, and we're going to provide uh, a buffer to that. So that's the open space area, that aspects of the project. <coughs> And we're starting to kind of create our open space framework that's more active, that's more park focused with an interconnected kind of greenway through the center of the neighborhood that will connect sidewalks down to phase one, but also it'll uh, lead into future phases as we head towards the town center. Um, related to this is the 
kind of related to open space natural resource protection is the 100 foot kind of setback um, requirement that we have through DEP um, to the Willowdale stream. And so Nick provided this, this um, good cross section that kind of illustrates the different levels of, of setback. So under the town zoning, there's a 75 foot stream overlay. We're going beyond that with the 100 foot stream setback through DEP. Um, in places, the, um, and then there's a conservation easement that applies to the corridor from a DOT permit. So in places, the 100 foot setback is more restrictive in other places, the conservation easement creates an even greater setback. In some cases, it's 125 feet. Um, in addition to that, our intention is to kind of program a linear park between both the uh, stream protection boundary and the conservation easement and the Downs Road with a bike path, some stormwater treatment areas, etc. So that's our intention for adding additional kind of um, protection to the uh, Willowdale stream. It meets DEP's expectations um, and the conservation easement and I think it's a good approach uh, along along the stream corridor um, and with the gravel <coughs> wetland we're kind of working hard on protecting uh, the stream and providing great kind of treatment uh, with runoff headed towards the stream. Relationship of buildings to the street um, is one of the kind of key plan development standards and the space and bulk standards are very tied to that. Um, and we're kind of gearing those to have very kind of minimal front setbacks to create that strong relationship of buildings to the street, to create that compact walkable pattern. Um, and we've kind of layered in neighborhood a neighborhood patterns section um, to our master plan, which is kind of design guidance that um, piggybacks on the space and bulk to say, okay, this is where, um, let me jump to that. This is the excerpts from the neighborhood patterns, which is design guidelines. Um, and it, it really kind of illustrates uh, for subdivision review, the relationship to the street of buildings based on the, the unit type or the dwelling type, um, and also the relationship to say the alleys. So it's hard to see from your seats, um, but it's in your package where we have a street layer, uh, which varies, the depth varies based on the, the unit type or the housing type, but that's where we expect front steps, front porches, stoops, and then we have a facade layer. Um, and if there's questions, Nick can get into kind of more detail during discussion where we expect the front of buildings to be. And then on the, on the reverse, we have for at least alley loaded um, lots, we have a garage, a garage layer on the back um, where we expect the, the entrance to garages to be. And then we have with street loaded lots, we have a kind of a garage layer and that's where we expect the, the front of garages to be so that there's adequate kind of parking in front of um, the garages and they don't interfere with sidewalks and the street right away. So we think with this guidance, um, at least at the master plan stage, this is kind of great directives that through subdivision um, we can get finer grain when we've had engineering plans, when we have an architect that's fully uh, engaged in, in laying out things that we can bring to you. Um, we think that getting too fine grained in space and bulk at this stage, um, I think we're gonna trip, trip up and, and kind of get ahead. So that's uh, relationship of the building to the street. Access management and interconnections is another one of the standards that we've been working on and provided in this submission. Um, the neighborhood pattern guidelines, we think help with that a fair amount in terms of where we're not gonna have a lot of access points along streets because there's gonna be private alleys that handle a lot of uh, the unit types. Um, and then where there 
and as the further you get into the neighborhood the more there will be driveways but the lower volume the streets will be where that's expected um, and then along the downs road which is really the street that we think access management and the staff thinks access management is the most important like phase one um, we're going to have kind of strategic access points. It's not going to have a lot of curb cuts along the Downs Road. It's going to have kind of major street intersections, maybe a few alley intersections, and that would need to meet, you know, the town's um, site plan review ordinance and, and subdivision ordinance in terms of making those connections. Um, this is in your package, and it's a general kind of connectivity plan that illustrates some street hierarchies um, in blue course is the is the downs road um, and then in kind of red and black are more kind of neighborhood streets um, with concepts for alleys um, in many of these areas to again kind of focus access um, limit driveways and, and have those be more kind of limited on the periphery uh, of the neighborhood um, in, in, in fewer locations than you would typically have with a residential neighborhood Uh, streetscape treatment is a uh, another plan development standard uh, it relates a lot we see to the street standards and the access standards um, we've we believe we've designed our master plan to be consistent with that um, we're working pretty hard to design the project with complete street design principles um, which the zoning asks for kind of rig uh, rigorously I would say that the street acceptance ordinance is trailing that rigor because <laughs> um, the town's street acceptance ordinance right now is, I would say, a bit out of date, a bit out of <coughs> sync with subdivision and site plan and zoning. So part of our challenge is not really wanting to call streets specific classifications because we don't know enough about we don't want to <laughs> um, kind of prejudge our street classifications and then ask for waivers from you that may not be necessary uh, we want to kind of work with the board on what's the right design for the downs road what's the right design for the neighborhood streets um, and work with you through subdivision to kind of figure that out um, I think most standards for the downs road make sense but if it's designed exactly to a collector street standard in the town of Scarborough, then our curves are going to be designed like you would design um, maybe Route 1 or Payne Road versus a complete street design. So we've kind of intentionally not classified these streets and want to talk to the board this evening and then at subdivision review about specifics around um, the street cross-section, frankly. so. What we have here is the Downs Road. It's laid out basically exactly like phase one, where you have 11 foot travel lanes, you have bike lanes, you have opportunities for sidewalks on one or both sides. There could be a multi-use path on one side, particularly along the linear park is our vision. Um, and then on the other two streets, we're envisioning those as to be neighborhood streets again 11 foot lanes typical of residential streets in scarborough and then providing opportunities for on-street parking um, depending on the types of units that are along those streets so if it's an alley loaded um, single family home or townhouse we'd expect on-street parking to supplement that you know alley and garage to the rear <coughs> if it's um, Street-loaded single-family homes, for example, um, we're anticipating there be some places where there's on-street parking for guest parking, but otherwise would be a, you know, um, a 22-foot wide to 24-foot wide um, street. The fourth category is we have a cross-section for our alleys, and we've reviewed that with staff and sort of learned from other projects in town. Have tried to make that design in a way that works best for residents but also kind of trash removal and fire access and um, service vehicles walkable pedestrian oriented design um, we've laid out the obviously it's a grid as i've talked about um, we've laid it out in a way to be very walkable 
um, and anticipate having sidewalks on all of these streets and also having a trail system um, that is a component to that. Um, we're planning a trail back to, to phase one. We need to get um, a wetland permit to cross a, a narrow wetland to get that trail. So it's <coughs> really in the hands of DEP and Army Corps just uh, in terms of getting that permit, but our intention is to apply for that permit and, and be able to build that trail. We're also planning, um, like I said, that bike path trail along the Downs Road heading up towards the center of the project. So placemaking is, like we've talked about with other phases, a big component to um, this district. And it is also for uh, this phase, like it has been in other phases, um, we're starting to, to figure out kind of some of the ideas around placemaking. Um, we are interested in trying a few pocket neighborhoods within the project, um, which is a, a pretty cool and exciting kind of neighborhood design where the houses front a green and are uh, accessed from the rear. That's this image here. And so that's a place for that particular neighborhood um, and the houses are focused around it. <clears throat> We're also looking at, and Nick's kind of working hard to figure out um, how to complement the kind of the gravel wetland that would have grasses and be sort of an attractive space with um, some paths and maybe a boardwalk that integrate and make that a focal point and not just a stormwater feature. And then have some um, green space, so active green space along it. So it's, um, there's space for, for play and kind of, um, activity gathering. <coughs> On-street parking is another um, plan development standard. We've incorporated a fair amount of it with this phase um, and think it plays a key role in um, providing additional guest parking, um, supplemental parking. It's also really important from a kind of a traffic calming standpoint and protects pedestrians on the sidewalk. And so we think it's appropriate on, on most of the streets, uh, including the Downs Road, where, it's, where there are straightaways and housing that relates to it. Um, in terms of the dimensional standards, we provided um, our proposal on dimensional standards, so the, the additional space and bulk standards. Um, they're very similar to phase one. Um, we're proposing to add some. Um, based on staff comments uh, that we want to talk about with the board this evening, uh, as came up through staff comments is, you know, what's the appropriate building height, say in this phase versus maybe the center of the project or other phases of the downs, given it's more residential. Um, and so our proposal is recognizing that our proposal is to establish a four story height limit um, for this residential phase. You know, we don't anticipate, uh, you know, a lot of four-story buildings in this phase, but like phase one, um, the Uplands is a four-story uh, multifamily building. We think that's appropriate. We think it fits the character of phase one. Um, and we, we see that this phase is similar to phase one, and it's, it's actually transitioning towards the grandstand building and towards the center of the project. Um, so again, we don't anticipate many four-story buildings, but we think it's important to have that ability, like in phase one, in those multifamily areas, um, and probably along the Downs Road and probably closer to the center of the project. Um, another standard we certainly can add that is in our neighborhood patterns, so the guidelines section, so it's, it's covered there as well, but if we certainly can add it as a sort of a space and bulk requirement is having a minimum garage setback um, of 20 feet from public sidewalk, which I think is the biggest concern is having, you know, enough stacking for a car to be not <coughs> interfering with the sidewalk along the street. Um, we'd want to kind of word that setback thoughtfully so that it's not a necessarily a 20-foot setback to say a side of a garage or we want it to be to the garage in terms of where the parking is in relationship to the like front of the garage, the, the garage overhead doors. Um, and I mean, other than that, um, I 
you know that Eastern Village has, you know, I've talked to staff about sort of specific space and bulk standards um, that are a bit more specific than what we've provided in phase one and here. Um, what, and if there are additional ones needed, what we'd ask of the board is establishing them through subdivision because that we're not yet at the place that we know whether it should be <laughs> three feet to a front step or five. Um, and we feel like the neighborhood patterns guidelines give a lot of direction to what's expected in this master plan. And through subdivision, we're gonna then have engineering and we're then gonna have everything laid out so that we can be very precise um, with house placement. And with a neighborhood like this, that specificity is pretty important. It's not as much in an R2 or an RF subdivision. So um, we would ask that if there needs to be additional space in bulk, then we could figure that out through subdivision um, with the board and staff. Um, I guess the <coughs> final plan development standard uh, that we wanted to walk through and, and we've talked about it, the, the first meeting is affordable housing. Um, the Uplands is providing a lot of it um, and provides a pretty generous credit towards uh, this phase and future phases. Um, I know they're not approved yet, so it's not a, a shoe in um, but their approval is going <coughs> to uh, occur, you know, over the course of the winter and spring. Um, and if for some reason it doesn't move forward, then we'll provide, we'll meet the requirement within this phase. Um, so we're not, you know, we'll certainly meet the standard. Uh, we expect the uplands will be approved and we'll be financed and move forward. But in the, in the instance it doesn't, um, we certainly will meet the standard within within this phase uh, like we did in phase one. So <coughs> that's kind of how we see our compliance with uh, the master plan. We've, Nick's done a lot of hard work uh, on kind of creating what we think is a pretty cool, exciting neighborhood that's gonna transition pretty well and, and feel pretty good and have a, a great mix of housing types that, that um, work well for the market and, and work well for the project. And we're kind of on the cusp of, to, to, to get much more fine grained, we need to jump into kind of engineering and architecture and, and take the next step. Because um, without kind of grading, without street design and more detail, I think we're probably not gonna be able to address too many more of the comments. Um, I think a lot of the comments are great and we expect to handle those um, through the subdivision site plan process. So, um, and I think that's also where we can get into more specifics on placemaking and, and open space design and trails and all those things following the master plan guidance that um, we've updated. <clears throat> Parallel with with this process, and then just as much subdivision site plan, um, we're work, we're starting to work with DEP on a couple levels of permitting. I think I talked about this last time a little bit. Um, there's an overall site law permit that we're now getting for the entire site that kind of sets parameters and guardrails for uh, the build out of the project. Um, but then, as different areas come forward with development, very similar to, to the town's master plan process. Uh, we would then get into more detailed, what's called level two review of the things that they wanna look at kind of area by area, which is stormwater, infrastructure design, um, natural resource impacts, things like that. So we're starting that process with DEP and um, we'll ramp it up as we get into our more detailed subdivision um, design and, and review with the board. It's gonna be concurrent review, so that'll just track along with the, the town subdivision review process. Um, DEP has that requirement for the 100 foot stream setback, uh, as I discussed, and uh, there's some kind of modest wetland permitting that's likely, like the trail crossing. There's some isolated wetlands um, that we'll be proposing to, to permit while preserving the obviously the vast majority of the wetlands. Uh, DOT review is similar but different. Um, we've applied for a traffic movement permit uh, modification that's ongoing. And this is sort of like DEP, um, more than this residential phase. We're, at, we're looking for permitting 
for kind of the next um, forecast and really kind of the next five years worth of kind of development so that we're not always applying <laughs> to DOT and they understand what's the bigger picture and can gear um, requirements and improvements and mitigation um, at a bigger scale and then there's going to be kind of triggers for when things need to be done. So we've incorporated this residential area into that larger approach and then we'll have you know thresholds when you reach this kind of trip you need to make this uh, intersection improvement or and so that's being done. Um, town staff is very involved in that as are their peer reviewers um, and again that's being handled at the same time um, as this process. So that's our um, overview. Sorry for walking through every <laughs> plan development standard. Um, I'm happy to go back to anything and, and, and Nick and Drew and Rocky are here to, as you, we get into conversation. Um, we're at the point that we want to really kind of fine tune this master plan and be able to kind of make, take the next step and be able to get into that finer detail, which you probably most are ready or interested in. Um, and to be kind of be clear on next steps, I know you've done this a few times now and um, but what we're thinking about for the next residential phase, phase is to is to, you know, there's going to be multiple reviews. There's going to be a subdivision review to kind of lay out in a phased way the road framework, lots, blocks, um, open spaces. And then a bit like phase one, um, there's going to be site plans, site subdivisions for maybe individual blocks or where there's a multifamily project, um, it'll be site subdivision. Um, and that would come after the, the initial subdivision layout. So um, stuff that you probably know, but I thought it was worth mentioning in general. So that's what I have. Um, and turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, we do have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, just approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, close public comment. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a lot to take in on this, of course, it's a big project, so uh, kind of want to kind of want to try to focus some of the discussions on specific topics. I, I think that would probably probably be the better way to approach this, just to hopefully give them some clear direction as we see here, and then we can, after we kind of figure out a couple of the bigger issues, then maybe just open it up to the board for anything in general that we haven't loose end here or there that we haven't kind of tied up. Um, so one of the things I'll just start with, um, I think the setbacks is it. I think that's, I know um, a good explanation, which is it's tough for us to kind of say for sure, right now, the second, this is what all your setbacks are gonna be. I think the one thing that when I was looking at it caught my eye is um, there was one section in there where it looks like it's variable. So if you put it, you had a 10 foot spacer. So this one could be three, that one could be seven. And I, I wondered uh, in general, just how, how code enforcement might view something like that. Fees, is he running out there all the time with a tape measure to make sure that you're keeping your buildings just far enough apart? You know, I think that was probably one of the concerns I had with the moving line. and wondered if, and I'm just spitballing, I'm not clear this for anyone, um, whether or not setting a hard standard, but allowing the flexibility for you to ask for a waiver, you know, say it's five feet off the line no matter what, and then, but still saying within this phase, come and say, you know, there's a reason why we want this building here and this one here, and allowing the board that, and I don't know if, that does, makes staff's life miserable, the applicant's life miserable. I don't, I don't know how that plays out, but I'm trying to figure, um, trying to make multiple, I think, entities happy as they develop this. <laughs> and and yeah. I, do, I, I do think it's worth noting, and, and I appreciate sort of the, the, the um, Dan Statement and Developments team sort of trying to figure out how to do space and bulk as they're building this. 
but the standard is pretty clear that space in bulk is to be approved as part of the master plan. The Eastern Village has a different process. It refers back to Section 7. So I, I guess I want to be pretty clear that it's staff's interpretation of the ordinance, and we've actually talked to our um, attorney about this on a, not because of this conversation, but that this is the time that space in bulk needs to be approved for this phase. Um, so I understand that presents certain challenges, and I think you know maybe to your point, Nick, we're um, providing some level of flexibility, and we can talk about what that might look like. But um, just wanted to sort of make that point early, because um, I know. That, yeah, so, but, um, but yeah, I, I think maybe in, in terms of Nick, if I understand where, you, where you're talking about sort of that side yard setback, and I know typically we have sort of a 10 foot separation, and that has to do with fire codes. And I think that's where the um, setback talked about at least a 10 foot separation. Um, and so maybe some of the question is well, if there's a property owner who buys a lot first and puts their building two feet from their property line, They've really now dictated for the next property owner who buys that they now have to be eight feet from their property line. Um, so sort of first in dictates what's happening. And it, um, you know, again, I know some of this might not be as difficult to administer with the first round of development, but certainly as properties are around for 30, 40, 50 years, multiple owners, buildings need to be rebuilt, sort of how those variabilities work. Um, I think really trying to codify that a little further uh, from an administrative and from a future property owner's perspective of knowing what they can do um, rather than sort of looking at the book and saying, oh, great, I've got a, a zero, a five foot setback, not realizing, well, actually, you have 10 feet because the other guys or other properties at zero. So, um, so I think there are, there are some things to, to continue to work through. Um, any uh, any board members have any specific thoughts on that, or even uh, the applicant if they had thoughts on kind of what we're we're saying here? Not that I expect full solutions this evening, but yeah. Roger. Um, would this concept is this different than phase one? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have two comments. Yeah. Uh, one is. I mean, we're proposing space in bulk. There's been comp, so it's not like we're ignoring space in bulk. Um, there's just been comments about should there be a minimum, except primarily a minimum setback from front yard about stoops or front porches mm -hmm. that might be. I think it's being asked to not just have design guidelines around that. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that. But we're proposing space in bulk. Mm -hmm. They're just minimal. It's a side yard is what. Um, Seems to be the one that right, I guess. moves left or right. Right, yeah. And I think there are other districts in town where there's side yard flexibilities, but I, mean, I don't know how that's been administered really lately with code officers. Yeah, and I actually was able to have a conversation with our code officers today, and, and you know, one of the one of the areas that we have that is Higgins Beach in particular, with, where we have our, our form based zoning. And I think part of that conversation, particularly with with the folks in the fire department, where you know Higgins Beach is a different situation. That's a neighborhood in which there's a lot of nonconformities. There's a lot of buildings that are already close. It's pre existing conditions, and so yes, the the form based zoning provides some additional flexibilities, but it's moving things to further towards conformance. I think the, the comment that we heard from the uh, fire department is here we're building a new neighborhood. So if we can get ahead of having these issues, then we can do that. And there, there are other ways of doing it. They also mentioned that you know using sprinklering buildings. So there, there are ways to get at these reduced setbacks um, through the codes. Um, but just need to be so like it, in, in you know I'm not I don't know all the uh, <laughs> building codes offhand but I know you know the, the statement was basically you know if the if the buildings are sprinkled then you don't have to worry about the 10-foot setbacks um, that becomes the, those issues go away um, yeah so that, we were the intent around that variable setback was really around 
garages, not homes, which is maybe that was our I made a mistake in not being kind of clear about that. But um, a detached garage. A detached garage. So the to provide some context, the idea is with smaller lots, especially when they're the garages in the rear because there's an alley. Um, garages can be great fences, um, and if you're allowed to shift the garage over, then it can be basically a fence to your neighbor, um, and and also kind of create some more yard space on the other side for you. Um, and so at the department meeting, we talked about that with the fire department and about where if there's if that's done with planning um, through construction process, then as long as you know they're providing that separation between the garages that they expect, then it shouldn't be a big deal. Um, so it wasn't intended to be single family homes or other types of houses that wouldn't have a setback. It was really detached kind of garages. Is that, and, and maybe it's not worded the right way to kind of get at. Yeah, to, to add a little bit more clarity there. So. We were talking about that for specific areas where we might have a detached garage to be alley loaded, be detached garage. So in the areas of this project that we're going to do that, this type of setback might might be warranted, might might really work well. In other areas of the project where we may have front load garages, it's not going to work. That's it's got it's not going to go that way. We don't need that. So it was really for specific areas, and that's why we were saying. If that can, if we kind of kick that can down a little bit, then when we come in for the subdivision, if we're going to do that style unit here, then we would want to talk about that kind of a setback. But if instead of doing that style unit, it might be a different style unit, then we may not need to talk about that because it won't apply. That's why we were looking for that flexibility. And if I've added confusion, I apologize. But um, without knowing, I mean, if you think about what we're doing here, we don't know exactly what type of unit. We've got several different types of units. So we don't know exactly what type of unit is going to go where on that plan yet. We've built in a lot of flexibility so that, you know, if we start with one style unit, and boy, that really sells well, people really like it, it works, we can do more of that. Or if we, you know, gee, that one isn't really the, the best one, another style will, would be better. We've got flexibility and we can do that. So, and that's how we're thinking about this phase the thing about this phase where we come in when we come to subdivision and we break off bigger lots and then those will then be further subdivided once we know all right over here we want to do this style unit over here we want to do that style unit we'll, we'll come back for those at further subdivisions so at that point then we would know do we want that do we need a different setback or does five feet work well, i think that's what i'm oversimplifying it or Using things, stop me, but. Yeah, I, I think some of the discussion we've had at the staff level, and please, Nick, the board has comments, obviously, <coughs> stop me, <laughs> um, was really um, sort of twofold. One, wanted to be sure that, you know, as, as part of this discussion, it's, it's, um, staff doesn't necessarily, you know, just wanted to raise and be sure the board was pretty explicitly understanding that. You know, with with sort of this, uh, with the note the way it is, that it may be that one property development dictates how far set back another property has to have its building from a property line. And if the board's comfortable with that, staff is as well. It's just we wanted to be sure that that conversation was had and understand that that's part of what's happening. And then as we had that conversation, it was really around not so much the first, and I said this before, not so much about the Risbera team building. It's this is going to be there for many, many owners and add-ons and those sorts of things. So how do we get at those issues? And there, there's ways to do it. Um, um, so again, I think it, what what would be helpful if the board's comfortable with the concept, we can find a way there. Um, we just need to know that if the board's comfortable with that concept. That one property may ultimately depict or decide. What another property can do in a certain if I can extent. build on that, Jay. So what yeah. I'm what well, what I'm thinking about, what we're thinking about is okay, we get to an area where we know, all right, we want to do 15 of those style lots. 
we're going to come to you and to do a subdivision, and we're going to know that in this area, it's going to be 15 of that style lots where we want those garages staggered. We're going to know that right at subdivision and go right on the subdivision plan. But until we get to that subdivision, today, we don't know where that is or whether we even really need it. So I guess that's kind of where I was probably driving my original question, and, and not just for you, but for staff and, and this board, is that, that concept of is it possible to put five feet in, but with language stating waiver can be granted during the subdivision phase, which still allows you the flexibility. However, you now are going to get a standard for each subdivision that comes in, so down the road in the future, whatever that subdivision that person wants to do an add on, it's defined. Um, and, and I know what you're, it's kind of trying to do two things, almost exactly what you're saying, but almost exactly what they're saying, which is you want to kick it down the road. I'm saying, okay, this could work if we could put a number on it and only, then pause. Only to subdivision. Right. But if once right. we get that subdivision plan approved and it has that setback on there, now code enforcement's got something to work with. Right. Yeah, I mean, subdivision plans kind of have a building envelope on it. Yeah. So the building envelope's either going to be like the neighborhood patterns one that shows five feet on both sides or for these garages on this alley that we're designing, it, the building envelope's going to be 10 feet on one side and zero on the other. But without that note, there wouldn't be the, fix, the flexibility to do that other alternative, which can create the thing that we're wrestling with is kind of creating nice places within a, in a more compact neighborhood. Like, and this is, it's important to have a little bit more green space and use the garage as a fence and you gain, 10 feet doesn't sound like a lot, but on small lots, um, it can be pretty valuable. So having that flexibility to, to design a better neighborhood, I think, as long as it meets yeah, the Yeah, I think what I, was, what I was also gonna say is that if, you, you know, if we're all thinking about these two acre lots that we've been building on forever and people have got a lot of flexibility and they can build anywhere, well, we're not gonna have that here. We're gonna have you know, we've got a narrow lot, that garage can only go in one place. Once we set those, you're not going to slide them around, or you're not going to do this lot one way and then flip it and do the other lot opposite. It's they're all going to have to stack, or they won't fit. So you're gonna, we, we're going to know a lot more than you typically would know, you know, on a, on a lot early on. And I do think, uh, you know, one thing, I'm sorry, Rocky. No, go ahead. Uh, I don't think we staff sort of appreciated the comment that Dan was just making yeah. that, okay, the minimum setback is still going to be five, you know, as this, and then as the note says, zero to 10, but then the subdivision plan, typically a subdivision plan will still just show five feet all the way around mm -hmm. on every <coughs> single lot. But if what I'm hearing, and, and maybe that was the piece that I wasn't quite I getting it, it so. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm making stuff up and get, getting us there, but, no, it, no, no. but it sounds like if the subdivision plan is going to say, okay, Lot, own, lot buyer of lot one, you have a zero split, you know, zero because of this footnote, so uh -huh. you get there. Buyer of lot two, you know you're buying a 10 foot setback, so, and it's shown on the subdivision because plan. Because know where those that, garages fit. At least so then, then I think that, that, that was the issue that we wanted to be sure property owners knew that, yep, okay, there are these variable setbacks, but you've now bought this. You had variability. We've taken it away. You've now <coughs> bought this. So and from a then, from a design side too, the nature of this being a master plan community, mm -hmm. we want to be cognizant of the fact that sometimes these master plan communities can be become very homogenous, especially if you're very prescriptive in the beginning with setbacks and the way buildings lay out on the site. And we want some flexibility in being creative and letting each of these typologies, as we design the building to each lot specifically for the site there's some flexibility that's driving a little bit of a pattern and we're not just prescribing it all at the beginning. So I think it's gonna make for a more interesting and, and more genuine feeling neighborhood ultimately. And um, we, just, we just need a little bit of that uh, creative flexibility at this point. So I don't know if there's language that'll help clear up the footnote that we can work through or it seems like there could be more yeah, I think to define it, it. Again, I think sort of understanding that, and I, it's helped clear things up in my mind. So obviously, I don't know if it has for board members or if board members even cared to begin with. So <laughs> I'm sorry to take up time. If it is, um, but again, I, I think what we, you know, 
clearly that might need a little more work on some language, but if we can get an understanding from the board, if you're comfortable with the direction that we're starting, that, you know, I, I, I think we're heading, and maybe I started to articulate, um, then that can help us sort of really refine this thing. Um, I, think that, yeah, I think a fair question to the board members right now is, um, how do you feel about allowing for more of a, a variable setback type of environment versus, you know, the, there it is, guys, you know, um, oh, any thoughts? I will say at the beginning, my engineer brain sort of was like, Ugh, on having something that was, you know, zero on one side and 10 on the <laughs> <Variable>. other. <laughs> um, but, you know, the explanation about a, a narrow lot, um, with a garage in it, and I just pictured, you know, like somebody's new backyard with a garage, like smack dab in the middle of it. Maybe you only have 10 feet on either side of that, or your garage is fully on one side, and now you have 20 feet of backyard that you can do something with. So um, that completely changed my opinion. Um, I, I, I understand if that is your intent, I understand that, um, appreciate it, and I think it's really creative approach to, you know, a, t a tighter, lot development than what we have to with that we're typically familiar with here um but i do like the idea of it being sort of pre pre-prescribed or predefined at the subdivision level so that it's very clear from there what you what space you have uh within which to work mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, we, we should have said this in our application and, and talk through it further but our intention is to have building of envelopes established in subdivision that where we're going to do these variable setbacks or it be zero instead of five, that it be on subdivision plan so that it's clear. Um, I mean, the other thing that Nick's worked on more than I, but we've been thinking a lot about is with these smaller lots, we actually anticipate houses probably in a lot of cases to be not necessarily in the middle of a lot, but closer to one setback, particularly when it's to the north versus south. Like we, these are kind of narrower, longer lots where yards are gonna be on the side um, of, on the south side of the house and then in the back of the house. And we'd love to have sort of the house and garage kind of be lined up and then it, it not be too prescribed, not every lot that way, so that we're really kind of maximizing the, the proper size of the house, the solar gain, the orientation, and feet matter on these yeah, lots. Yeah, and when I, you, you think about these lots, you get five feet on this side of the line and five feet on this side. What do you do with five feet? So if it's, if it's shifted, well, this guy's got 10, well, like, he's got 10 on this side. It's so like one and a half it, lawnmower pass. Yeah, you know, <laughs> five feet, I mean, what do, you, what do you do with it, right? But you can kind of line it up so you've got usable space. And the, and and the, the idea of the, you know, the garage being the fence, giving you some privacy, giving both sides some privacy, it's kind of made a lot of sense to me. And to Dan's point, you know, about orientation and thinking specifically about each lot as a, as a site, um, you know, these lots are going to, the orientation changes, you know, with um, the uh, orientation to you know, the sun and wind, et cetera. So having some flexibility to be able to move a garage or slab building helps you know so that we make sure that we design useful landscape space and make sure that the building is lining up to the street um, appropriately and create buffering etc so when I think about specifically the single-family houses in this phase versus the single-family houses we did in the first phase single-family houses in the first phase were basically all street loaded and that was primarily because of the way the lay of the land mm -hmm. we didn't have you know, we had a kind of a round piece of land there where the wetlands came around and wetlands were in the middle. So we're kind of hemmed in with what we could do. We've got a, a lot more of a grid system here. Lots are going to be a lot more uniform in this area. So I, I really think this approach is going to work well for that, that area. So the image up there is the neighborhood patterns and it's guidance, but we wanted it to be meaningful. Like, we wanted it to be kind of zoning light to inform. This is what we expect to be in these ranges with our front facades, our front stoops, our rear garages, our side yards. Um, but we're feeling a little bit <laughs> kind of hamstrung because we haven't laid out everything. 
quite yet. You know, we're I've done all the engineering. We haven't laid the, the grids all out. It's definitely five feet. Or, um, so, and I understand that that's why we tried to kind of create fairly flexible space and bulk with good guidance um, toward heading towards subdivision around what you'd expect when you see the housing types. Nick? Yeah. Generally speaking, I'm comfortable with making, you know, the, the envelope arrangements at the subdivision uh, level. I hope this gives you folks the ability to take a look at these uh, layouts and find out which, what is the most conducive way to get maybe the solar elements of this, because I think you have a great opportunity now to to showcase different, these different neighborhoods and different building types with the ability to take advantage of that solar. And given that, whether it's on the garage and not the house, um, I think giving a little bit of that flexibility for that siting um, may end up being a, um, a blessing in disguise. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, minimum lot area and the single family minimum lot area is 2,000 square feet. That's not terribly large. What's What kind of a house can you build on 2,000 square feet? We, we, had a, we have a, a typology in mind, um, kind of a, we're calling it a cottage court typology. Um, that would be more square and fit within that envelope, but it would basically be more or less kind of zero lot line development, like a, like four cottages kind of a line. Um, uh, it's a little bit tough to verbalize it. But about a 900 square foot, <coughs> some one bedroom, some two bedroom. So the, what we're talking about in terms of the single family houses are tiny houses. They're 900 square feet. Some, some of them will be. And we've also got some other some other floor plans that are 1,800 square feet. And those will fit on the bigger, what, what size lots of those? Uh, 40 by one, 110. 40 and 50 by yeah, 40. 110. So how many square feet? Uh, the houses? The lots. Um, 5,000, 6,000? Because as I, I looked at the Grisville comments, some of those lots really were, you know, were small and it, it started to get crowded. And as I recall from when we looked at those, they were four to 5,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. So I started to try to imagine what 2,000 square feet would look like and came up with um, something that actually wasn't pleasant to think about uh, in terms of crowding, in terms of, um, you, you said originally, I think something like 200, you were envisioning 220. Units. Units. Um, I've seen uh, it. It started to, in my mind, to reflect certain um, subdivisions outside of Richmond, Virginia, that came up in the '50s in the Hen Henrico area, uh, where they were on extraordinarily small lots, and it didn't didn't wear well in the long run for the people in the houses, or or f they were not. And they did not end up desirable neighborhoods 20 years later. And because of, I think, the size, the attempt to put in a lot of houses in the 50s, most of them, um, for the military folks coming back, and I would hate to see us kind of coming up with housing arrangements and, and lots and a development that gets us back to the, we've got to throw up an awful lot of houses because a lot of people want houses, so there are a lot, there's a lot of call. And to me, there's a, there has to be that sort of balance between um, providing housing for people, keeping it better. Dignified. And dignified. Uh, and as I think about you know, a 900 square foot, I know what that looks like, because my daughter's living in that now. Um, and 
we have a chance to come up with something, whether it's affordable housing or market rate housing, you know, we have a chance to come up with something better. So I'm, I'm really bothered by a 2,000 square foot minimum because all of a sudden, within the code, within the design standards, then we have a potential for an awful lot of tiny houses sitting there. Can I ask real quick, are all of the, these builds on these smaller lots, are they going to be governed by a homeowners association or a condo? Yes, yeah. so the whole thing will be, yeah. and then there'll be some associations within. So that, see, that gives me a little bit of more comfort, knowing that there's usually a body behind it to make sure that place isn't littered with toys and bikes and as you drive by it just starts to look like a junkyard or you know but I if I could could I address yeah. the, the housing types so and we haven't brought this to you because it's still it's still in the works and we know we're gonna have to show this to you at subdivision we're, it's all cooking right now so we've got four different I'm wrong, four different so we're trying to hit different markets like we did in phase one we wanted different markets but in phase one our single family houses, we were still stuck on that, you know, load the garage from the front, you know, everything's linear this way, and Nick and Dan did their best with us, but we were hemmed in with the site and it was, it was difficult. Um, I don't wanna say I'm drinking the Kool-Aid now, but I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid and understanding that we don't have to have all front load garage, you know, traditional colonial with a garage on the right, drive in the front and, you know, we're going to have an area where we're going to have some of those because some people want those. But we also know that you know, we need these little cottage courts. We need to, to be able to hit that, not a tiny house, but a smaller home. Not everybody wants a, a great big home. Um, so we want to hit you know, 900 square feet. We've got another model that's around 1,400 square feet. We've got one that's 1,800. And then that 1,800 can easily become 2,400 if you go out over the attached garage. And some of these have garages attached to the left or the right some have behind. When we have these narrower, longer, linear lots, the garages are actually behind. Um, and you'll hit a lot of those off the alleyway. Some of those may be attached to the home, some of those may be detached. So I think we've, we've got a handful of different house designs that we can hit everything from you know, 900 square feet on up to 2,500 square feet on different size lots. And what I'm envisioning with this project is if we have some lots that are small that are really geared towards, all right, we know over here, 900s fit fit right there, and over here, larger homes fit, and that's all going to be part of our, our subdivision process. But we've kind of laid this grid out so we can mix and match to whatever feels right or whatever the market demands are as we move through the project. So a couple hundred <laughs> units, but if you if you think about how that breaks down, you're going to have some condominiums, we're going to have some apartments, we're going to have some single-family houses, and the, those houses are going to be of several different styles. So it will be different sizes. Wait, when this whole project started, how long ago? Um, the, the very first master plan, you referenced um, a housing development uh, out in, I think, Bellingham or out in the Seattle area. Uh, and I was very impressed with that. And I took a look at a lot of, a lot of the houses and a lot of the, the projects that were done. That worked with the small houses, and a lot of them were uh, focused on the park in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were 1,100 square feet, 1,000 square feet, up to about 1,500, and very, very carefully done. And I thought it was an excellent design. Uh, and if that's where you're going, then I think it does meet a market that's out there, people who want a neighborhood without a lot of upkeep, mm -hmm. but don't want a condo. Mm -hmm. You know, want to be able to put their garden where they put their, you know, where sure. they can put it. Um, so I guess they, uh, the proof is in the, is in the subdivision, but I am still queasy mm -hmm. about a minimum, about agreeing to a minimum of a 2,000 square foot lot. Understanding that those uh, apparently are the ones mostly that are the um, I have the garages in the in the back. It's the pocket, yeah. I mean, I think you're thinking of pocket neighborhood design from probably Pacific Northwest. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember you you you, you referenced it when we when, when the whole thing yeah, when this whole thing that. started. Actually, is, is an option. Like this in, in Denver, 
I don't know, a month and a half ago, two months ago, and uh, it, it really hit me. Okay, here's where we're handling this thing. And, and look, it does work. <clears throat> and they even get snow there, and it works. So I, I was pretty pleased with it. So, like, in those pocket neighborhoods, you would, you would have a really tight lot, and you do that by creating all your common spaces kind of commonly owned, right, around a right. park, right? And the garage is usually kind of off-site, and you walk to your your home to your unit but right now um, I don't think I saw on your um, starting with page 43 whatever this is the single family lane loaded um, I don't see these I did, I did not see um, the pocket neighborhood concept in here yep. on how that would be designed and yet you've talked about the pocket neighborhoods and access um, from lanes, I guess, um, but I don't, you know, it's not in yeah. here, and that may be more of where these small houses go rather than in the private uh, uh, lane-loaded houses, uh, lots. We just, in, I think we just didn't get into a specific classification around the pocket neighborhood as a typology because it starts to get into a specific but typology. It, but right. one of the things I, I guess one of the things is I, I look at it you talk about high density moderate density low density and I start to think well what fits into what are we talking about with high density with moderate density how many right. houses how yep. many units are we talking about when you say high density how many units are we talking about moderate density uh, and as soon as you, you start to talk about high density but single family, well, what, all of a sudden now, what does that look like? If you're saying high density uh, and it's apartments, okay, you know, I, that I can visualize. If you're talking about high density uh, with a lot of lots at 2,000 square feet, what does that look like? Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden that's a, a whole different way of thinking about, about the housing. Mm -hmm. So if you took the if you took the garages away from these units and they weren't included, you had no garage essentially on that lot, say in the in the center of the image. That could be conceivably a two thousand square foot lot. Street parking then, or or no, you're talking you about would, lane? Are you talking about garage parking? And it's one of those things. Like we, once we get the site plan, we can show a little bit more how it how it works. But the idea is that the house is isolated on the lot, then you have. You have the common space that it fronts onto an alley in the back for loading um, where you can either fit a, a driveway without a garage or you have the garage attached to the home um, or the other option like more of a more of a traditional pocket neighborhood the garage is actually off the line <coughs> like in that image the garages might be banked behind the homes so oh, you could essentially you could essentially you could park in a carport and then walk to your front door and it so it kind of keeps the infrastructure and the amount of paving consolidated, um, and it's a you know it's a smaller, more affordable lot. It's a, it um, becomes more of a compact neighborhood that's less about parking cars and garages and garage doors, and more about um, you know interacting with your neighbors on this sidewalk as you walk from the garage to your, your front door. So and more about so the need for bicycle racks and bicycle lanes on some of the small, and and on some of the smaller like smaller roads. This graphic sort of illustrates that, what you're talking yeah, about. Pretty much an pretty option well of what you're talking about. Inside without there's, there's, there's no real pocket yeah. neighborhood that I can there may yeah. be so, but I can't um, you see we have a garage and we don't have a garage. Yeah, there's there's options where we could have a, an attached garage situation or even no garage, but this would be a pocket kind of a, the beginnings of a pocket neighborhood yeah. design. And it's the design I can tell you has evolved from that quite a bit, um, in a more attractive way, I would I'd, say, in a I'd more like efficient. I'd like to see way. the evolution. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. So because good. most of these pocket neighborhoods really are are, are enclosed in their triangles or their semicircles or mm -hmm. um, the not necessarily just squares. Right. Um, so, but anything other than a square becomes difficult to site a garage <coughs> well, or, or to create the or, yeah. tree, or to create the access to the front of, of the houses mm -hmm. 
I, I like the idea. I can't. I gotta. I gotta see it. So, yeah. one of the questions to if I'm hearing sort of part of that Rachel understands the concept but wants to has concerns that it, this could go really well or it could not go well, right? Yeah. And so one of the just trying to think of what are the ways that we can help to outside of sort of visual representations. I know you've sort of talked about wanting to come at subdivision. I mean, I was starting to think about, I, I know we've put this in our comments and I don't think this will necessarily address it, but we've talked about, you know, trying to, at least with the space and bulk, identify minimum um, lot area per family as well um, as part of the space and bulk. But as, as this conversation has gone on, I was wondering, have, have you thought about using floor area ratio? Would that be a way if we defined what that what and I you know I'm now looking to you for Nate I I really don't know if that would provide us what we're looking for or Rachel <laughs> and again we'll need to know if other board members have similar concerns but is that is that a way of maybe broaching part of this design issue to sort of say okay on these smaller lots they'll only be you know the building can was impervious cover which, right. yeah, which exists in the zone. You're thinking and maybe of floor area being two story, so right. Or you know, yeah, whether it's you know, sort of gives you a, a, I mean, a sense of how big the, the structure area. could be, or how much density of structure you could have within the area. Because I think that's your what I'm hearing is the principal concern is not so much that you can't have 2,000 square foot house uh, lots that have attractive design, is you could have 2,000 square foot lots that have. <laughs> not one of the design. things we've doesn't answer that yeah. that question to us, but one of the things that we're trying to do with these small lots is to create opportunities for individual lot ownership. I mean, often you'll see these types of neighborhoods in their condominiums, and so that's you know it's two acres, but per unit it's probably two thousand square feet of area right. in some of these neighborhoods. But you don't ever hit that because it's. Know, 20 units on one piece of land so it sounds like a small lot it is it's sharing a lot of common infrastructure so it I mean it can make it you know 5,000 or 6,000 square feet but then they're owning to the center of the common and then you get into other levels of kind of complications around maintenance so I mean, it's frankly we may be going after something we never use right Exactly. It just winds yeah. up being a condominium right. anyway, and we don't do, yeah. we don't do the twenty by twenty foot by. That, that really right. was more geared towards the townhouses. I I thought we were, we were thinking about. Well, there, there was a separate townhouse one there, there. Yeah. separate yeah. design for that. Yeah. But. I I think um, it presents a really opportunity, a really unique opportunity. Your market will dictate this whether people buy that from you or not. But you know, I just made a, a note. At the, beginning of our conversation on this that I, I think it's really I appreciate that effort and I think that for a lot of people that could mean the difference between home ownership or renting an apartment um, if you know if their budget doesn't dictate more than a thousand dollars a month I'm making that up but um, but if they see the opportunity here and don't need a lot of space but it's important to them to, to own their own home and have um, input on things like garden or outdoor space, maybe they don't need or want a car. And for, for somebody like that, having a smaller footprint home means they have more yard than a larger home on a larger lot with a garage. Um, I think that's the type of diversity that, that frankly, we could benefit greatly from here um, in, in attracting that type of people. They might be older, they might be younger. You might have older next door to younger living in the same style. Um, style house and it, I, I could just see that being attractive to a variety of people and a, and a different variety of people than some of the other sort of our more traditional sized and scaled homes. And the, the, the intent with this neighborhood too and it should be kind of depicted in that sketch is that there's a lot of variation like even within each block mm -hmm. and there's I don't think any intention on any of our part to lot farm out oh, <laughs> 2,000 square foot lots everywhere that's that's not um it wouldn't be conducive to a good diverse neighborhood that we have an area and we've got some different size lots probably. yeah so um 
But could somebody define for me what a high density, moderate density, low density, whatever the uh, divisions are that you have, what, what you're talking about when you say it's high density, how many, how many units? Um, moderate density, how many units? What's on an average? For a range, at least. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I mean, higher density, we're anticipating those are apartment areas um, of the project um, and condos. And those are probably in the 15 to 30 units an acre range. I'm going to probably higher, I mean, 20 to 30, because the zoning allows 20 units per acre overall. We're going to have higher density areas where you have apartments, where you have that probably 30 units per acre. And then we're going to have the low is going to be now 6 to 10 units per acre in single family. Um, I think for phase one average held it. Six or seven units. Yeah, and yeah. moderate. Yeah. Overall, it's so not dissimilar to phase one where you have an apartment section, you have some different housing types. That's what we're excited about is trying these. And they're right, range. And they're right next door to each other. Right. Or could be. Right. Um, yeah. You gotta ask the question, though. So, highest well, density is 30 say? units per acre, and the lower end is gonna be six to eight. Um, and then moderate is in between. Um, but the concern is, like the the interest is at the higher end, the, what the higher end of the threshold is, right? Not necessarily the lower end. So we could build slightly lower density because six to eight units per acre at on single family is still barely moderately higher density for a single family. So. Um, just helps me visualize, yeah. you know, when you start to look at, well, this area is this. Mm -hmm. um. The zoning allows 20 units per acre. We didn't touch it in phase one. We're not gonna, overall, we're not gonna get close to that overall in phase two. There's gonna be areas that are apartments that yeah. by their nature are gonna be in that 30 units per acre range. They're offset and they're more than offset by the areas that are gonna be five to eight units, single family, you know, alley loaded, some similar to other projects in town, like Eastern Village, Dustin Crossing. Um, these pocket Could neighborhoods are gonna be denser because they have a lot of small little houses, but I think we're hopeful to do maybe two pockets that might have eight to 10 units per pocket. So to Nick's point, we're not gonna do, you know, 200, Tiny houses. I don't think the market's there for that. We're excited to try it. Yeah, we certainly would like to have a dozen, dozen and a half. Have that, that housing opportunity, which I think there's a market for. Could you define a linear park? A narrow, long park. <laughs> what What is show. on, what is, what constitutes <coughs> that park besides a trail? Um, like how's it programmed? <laughs> what, what might go in it? Yeah. Um, we don't know yet. I mean, I think it's, it, you know, as, as part of the next level of design, we honestly, we haven't gotten to that level of design yet. But um, green. Yeah, green it, it would be, I'm not trying to skirt the question at all. Yeah. Um, well, only a little, but. A, a, little, a little bit, but, but in, in a genuine way. I mean, really, really, you know, design wise, we just, we just haven't gotten to that dig, level of design. Dig a little deeper. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, I think we had in mind, in particular, with the linear park that's along Willowdale, right? Between Downs Road and Willowdale, we're calling that a linear park. The idea would be, um, I think staff actually had a great idea with um, a kind of multi-use path. I think that's cool. It, it Maybe decreasing the um, impervious surface or the street width a bit on Downs Road and dedicating a little bit more of that paving, whether it's soft surface or, or um, impervious paving into a multi-use path that lives within that um, that quote unquote linear park is cool. Um, that could be a nice way to animate that space. The other idea um, being Wait a minute, just, let, just yeah. for a minute, just let me ask you a question. So along that area, uh, bikes could would yeah bicycles. It could, it could be like a bike path. Wheelchairs. Yeah. Sure. Like yeah. the one on Gorham Road. Yeah. 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 It's, good. Uh, it's more like um, I think it would be like the Western Promenade. Yes, it, like yeah, not a like mulch path. 
that's not what no, I mean, <laughs> that's don't have, there's, there's a road, there's the park, and then there's a cliff. Yeah, it would be, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, not, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a separated yeah. multimodal path, yeah. right? Okay. And um, along that, we were thinking there could be features or there could be um, kind of waypoints or moments, right, along that path where you have, maybe you have interpretive elements. I know that we, I've been working with Drew quite a bit on the stormwater design. Um, and we've been talking about some uh, bioremediation cells along that um, part space. And there could be opportunity where you can stop, there's a bench, and there's a bit of interpretive signage that talks about the water cycle and, um, and treatment and plants. Um, and something that celebrates um, that uh, the Willowdale Hunting Corridor in that landscape. So that's, that's in as far as I've thought about it at this point that many park spaces but I'm gonna, it, I'm it gonna would quickly be wrangle us back yeah. over to space and folk I don't I don't think we wrapped it up and I, okay. I want to stay Sorry. on a, that topic and just square it away because it, if it's left loose then it's just gonna be haunt us in a couple minutes so can, <laughs> can we just January. yeah Roger uh, I don't know if we, how do you feel about the space and bulk discussion before we move on from it well it seems to me and, and maybe I've not understanding this, but it seems to me we got two issues, two overriding issues. One is, as I understand staff, <clears throat> you want to make sure that it's clarified so when in the future, if we have other large phase projects, there's sort of like a benchmark or at least there's, there's a definition. Um, no, it, it wasn't so much about this phase establishing other phases, it was really about lot owners within this phase. No, I, that's what I mean. Okay. That's what I mean. When, I, when okay. I'm saying phases, I mean, like, um, me, oh, well, let me just continue. Maybe it'll make more sense. I, I see your point of view because you, you, you're basically looking at <clears throat> what the market will bear, and that's where you want the flexibility. But staff is concerned that by giving you that flexibility, that you're kind of leaving yourself open for future developments. Or maybe maybe I misunderstood that. Uh, again, when you say you future developments, it's really about just not, not this place, but this particular project. But okay. say say somebody else wants to develop another place over a multi-year, uh, you know, with, with many many dwellings and everything. Yeah. And and they want to also go by, you know, I mean, the market is changing. We're, we're seeing the market change, like at Eastern Village and all these other places. And I think you want to be flexible. You don't want to be tied into something concrete. So, but I think staff wants to. You, oh, you when we to, get to subdivision, we will be tied. Right. Yeah, no, I understand that. But I think that can that can answer the yeah. staff's issue with, you know, how do we enforce that, and what is the you know what does the homeowner know later on? Yeah, no, no, right. there's a bigger concern about after we build it, ten years down the road. You know, what's the next user, two users down the road, what are their rules and regs, and yeah. what do they do about that separation? Yeah, I think we nail, we nail that at the subdivision phase. Our concerns have not been about sort of precedent setting for other developments. This board isn't a precedent setting board, and each project has its own ordinance to go by, so. Okay, then so I'm that, not, I misunderstood yeah, the earlier conversation. Yeah, okay. yeah that, was, that wasn't a okay. concern. Space and bulk, get on that, and I get the sense that there'll be some language worked out. Yeah, I think if, if the board's comfortable with the direction, I think mm -hmm. there was, I think, really uh, a number of things came to light tonight that I don't know, if, you know certainly helped staff understand a little better. Yeah, and hopefully, help there board was some members. narrative that was added yeah, tonight. Right. That, so, I think certainly we, helped. I think we can work I think we have pretty good staff, feels like we have pretty good direction. All right, one topic down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the one one of the other things that, and I don't know how this plays in, probably more along the lines of you know green space and just the overall site. Um, but I know there was some question about whether or not <coughs> finding the street types at this point in time, and I heard you address it during the presentation that. I still don't know what this is all going to look like at the end. And I guess it begs the question, at least in my mind, is this another item that during subdivision 
is more appropriate to take up, or are, is staff saying we really kind of need to know what these streets are going to be as we go? Yeah, and if I if I might, like I, I think the the issue might be getting bigger than what staff really intended it to be mm -hmm. at this point. Really, what we're talking about, and I, what I'll do is I'll I'll have folks um, on the connectivity plan. There's street typologies that are identified as Downs Road, Secondary Street, Tertiary Street. When you flip just two or three pages later, and we look at our our um, oops, I the wrong one, our cross sections, these are identified as Street Type A, Street Type B. All we all we're asking for is sync them together. Is, is sync them together. Yeah. So at this point, we're, we're not talking about. I, did, I sort of heard Dan, and I understand yep. where you guys went with it yep. about connecting to our street acceptance ordinance. That's really not what we're talking. It's okay. really that. Got to get a terminology. Yep, it's just meeting. about terminology on these plan sheets. So I think that is a relatively. Unless other board members have issues, I think it was a relatively light Sense. lift. Second problem solved. Just cruising. <laughs> <laughs> and Jamila, so I'm capturing. I mean, I know you and Angela have had more conversations yeah. about that. We, I mean, a, to... we did have a specific comment just from past discussions with the applicant on the connectivity plan about more of the colors or the type of street. So if you look at the plan, um, there's that street that goes along the park, the linear park from the Downs Road. We understood that to become like a main street into the project but it's not labeled that way. So we were just sort of confused if we misunderstood or if it's maybe labeled wrong or tertiary is a word that I don't understand. Um, <laughs> which that, that really street works. right there, thank oh, you, Rocky. If that you look back. Yeah, yeah. We understood that one to become like the, down, the main. Right into the center. All the way into the town center? Yeah, it was, is that not the case? We're not, uh, we're not there yet, yeah, but. Um, okay, so we, were, we thought that would we thought that one should be red, basically, yeah. as a sub collector or whatever you want to call it. I don't. I mean, I don't. It it make it, that's plausible. We could make it. Red. Yeah, I guess. Because it, it, I mean, it's it, it. it's kind of a like a primary or I don't know secondary feeder for the neighborhood, right? Yeah. If you if you think about the way that goes, yeah, yeah. People living in here are going to use that. Yeah, that's well, where that's this side, more traffic. That makes one, sense. But it's. But we're not necessarily at the point in. where we'd say, like, it's a primary connector all okay. the in no. the town center. Just, just was really questioning it. Yeah, I think it was really about what type of street type, again, A, That's B, or C, be, are yeah. we doing oh, this? Yeah. Right. And that so, can be figured out. Yeah, I think, it, again, just based on the prior conversations, it seemed like that might be a busier road than or maybe that. Yep. Uh, yep. My one question is, is that a dead-end alley on the... Mm, I uh, go all the way over there, yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh, on this plan, it is. It's a diagram. It, it won't be. It won't be. Yeah. It, okay. Based on like the internal design work we've been doing, that won't be the condition. Okay. Yeah. We wouldn't intend to do something like this. Like no, that. but it's it on the plan, so I didn't know what. Um, yeah. yeah, we're showing alley areas and street areas. Same. What about for the one that looks like it would otherwise connect to the primary road? The yeah, down, the, down the other road. one. This, it, right on the the blue road in the middle. The dead end. This no. road. That road. No, there's yeah, there's a, there's a dead end alley right there. there. Right there. Oh, that. Right there. Yeah, so that one um, would likely connect into Downs Road. Um, and we're studying whether... We may have one or two dead end uh, alleys, but they would be very short stubs, so they'd almost act like a hammerhead in a fire turnaround. Um, and so we're trying to balance. We want these these all these lots to be um, alley loaded, and we're trying to also limit um, limit curb cuts and access to Downs Road. Good, the Downs Road. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we're trying to balance. We want to have that that connection and the secondary, you know, at least two points of connection to any given site. Um, but we don't want to create too many curb cuts or create sight line um, issues, especially along Downs Road. So Yeah, and there's a lot of traffic considerations with that too, relative to site distances and where right. the cars are actually entering. So we have, we have to look at that. And that's like long. getting into engineering yeah. level of detail that we just need to work out a little more. So I have I have one 
just recommendation slash suggestion that 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 road that does split off that looks like it could potentially just run right into the center we thought about you're going to build it as it's going to suit the needs for this part of it and you're probably going to have a little bit of foresight into what it might lead into i guess my concern would be what if it's a smaller type and we find that we're feeding much more traffic into the center of that area than maybe that road could have been better designed are we going to leave some easements or right away as if it ever needed that expansion i mean if, because if you're building right up you know right up onto a sidewalk you know now you're talking about I don't know, you're just dealing with a big traffic problem at that point because you, you can't tear the house down and expand the road. Um, but we wouldn't necessarily want to build like an oversized right away to accommodate like. Correct, I get that. Like if it's, you know, if it's if it becomes a busier road, like a, a, say a 60 foot right away, which is a pretty good average, mm -hmm. um, that can accommodate street parking. Um, but do you, you see what I'm saying though is without uh, that known entity, whether or not that almost becomes your primary road into the center of it, the project, right. I could just see it happening. You know, you know what I mean? Just if it's, I mean, I, I don't know how that next phase looks, but just the direction it takes right into where. I think that's why we pointed it out. Yeah. And have you yeah. thought about maybe providing where you do show the right of way continuing, which we appreciate because that's the whole idea is interconnectivity. Yep. But to get to Nick's point, if Downs Road is really where you want people the primary traffic going, maybe having that be a terminus where it is now, and then having the streets go out and around it, so you know, so that so it's instead not of, instead of having this, maybe you, it's up here or it's over. Right. Exactly. I can tell you, it, it may very well do that. So, so, so that way, that's right, to yeah. to address Nick's concern, where you would think, okay, yeah. if, if I'm going, going in here and I want to get going, it's probably not, not going to be the condition that that becomes a primary arterial yeah. street all the way to the center. It's probably going to, the, the, the next intersection is probably going to be offset. Yeah. Or That's the, fine. the initial design, we can promote the traffic to go to Downs Road by doing stop control at the other roads. You know, no one wants to go 200 feet and stop every, if you need to get to the town center. So we can promote traffic to go on the Downs Road, which is where we want everyone to go. That can be in. So I think during the design phase, we get a look at it. I mean, maybe it is shifting the road so that it's not as easy as a four-way stop. You have to turn and go, and that really discourages people from wanting to take that road to the town center. Yeah. Run belt, run belt, do it. I think you know, <laughs> if you live in this area and you're going to head towards the town center, yeah, you'll you'll go this right. way. But if you're coming from another area, you're going to be out here on the down. That's going to be like travel road. Yeah. Yeah. We want we want to keep people yeah. wanting to be there. Okay. Yeah. Well, a, I, I guess my that, so overall general comment though ideas. is if you can yeah. see into your crystal balls, like if you like, oh, that's got the potential, yep. like making sure that there's something there, either the extra space or whether it's oh, that it works you redesign it right. Yeah. 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 That's all. I think that's a good point. It seems to me the other thing to think about, given that that's quite a the gravel feature, the gravel wetland feature in, in the park, is that um, if there are other amenities in that area, such as a gazebo or concerts or anything else, um, you actually are going to, there are going to be a lot of people that head that way. So you're really going to have to think about the usage of the park, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as whether people are just going to use that road to head into the, the town center. Mm -hmm. I don't see that, that road being a through road. I think it's a, a point taken. It's a good comment. Well, and I think we see this park as more of a neighborhood park. I do see yeah, it's going to be more park like neighborhood coming, serving. But yeah. I think this is more neighborhood kind of use. Mm -hmm. Not that somebody wouldn't drive there. They might. Um, but I. Well, as I said, it depends yeah, on, on what you, how you're going to program that, yeah, yeah. how the neighborhood folks mm -hmm. are going to program it. Because right. even well, even as a neighborhood park, folks might want to have an outdoor concert on the Fourth of July. Mm -hmm. you know, who knows? Um, and if they do, that's going to, you know, it goes in the leader and somebody's going to say, well, I'd want to go there too. And all of a sudden it's a, it's, if it is itself attractive, people are going to go, to, <laughs> yeah, people are going to, people are going to go to it because it is attractive. Cover that one. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did I miss anything huge before I open it up to just general thoughts and comments? Um, we touched 
on the electric? I think they did in their... Um, your intention is above ground, only on Downs Road, and then it dives under everywhere else, correct? Is there a chance we could take it down through the Downs Road at this point now? I, we missed the boat on the first phase. I get that, but I'm always reminded of downtown Falmouth on Route 1, and they took their three phase and they buried it all. And it, you drive down there and you look up and it's nice not to see wires. Is there a way we can get that trough so that we don't see wires? Just way. It's not a way that I'm willing to do. Well, but, what uh, if then you, you also consider happen. putting, you know, some of this open area and your stormwater drain area and we get some generation there? Um, that could come. Two different things away. I, yeah, the way I but it all kind of mm -hmm. becomes the, the bigger picture. So I pushed to stay overhead. You think about Falmouth. Where they put that underground in Falmouth, it was pretty well all developed. They knew what was there for uses. Sure they did. You put that kind of power underground. But you know exactly what's going to be your uses here. Only to there. Yeah. I'm just saying, all can around. we get it to here at least underground? It may have to go back up, but I don't know. I was in uh, uh, Rhode Island in Providence, and the entire city has worked its way, and now it's all underground. But we're talking from here to here. If it has to go in a duck bank, that's not the place to do it. Why? It's too expensive. And you don't you get too many unknowns. Duck bank is a pretty you know, pretty big thing to bite off. I think we're gonna wind up having to do that when we get to the downtown. Because we're not gonna want to look at those poles. But I I envision you know this coming along the on the left hand side of the downs road is really not visually horrid. I mean look at how it's parked with you know, it was done out there. Yeah. Then you, know. you, you put underground there. That duck bank system is is big money and, and a lot of I didn't know enough back then. Known. What's that? <laughs> I didn't know enough back then. <laughs> um, uh, that's actually, all. it's a I know it's a I know it's a financial thing. It's a financial thing um, with a lot of unknowns and that's the that's a piece that well, we, we know we need. Three there's not a lot of unknowns here, Rocky. You know it's <laughs> going to be residential. And this it, will all be under. Yeah, if it's this we want to stay overhead. Yeah, we and I, I know. And but drop down in and feed, and we'd put it. I mean, I'd put it on the other side of the brook if you could get it done, but you can't. Get it done. I mean, you can't get it done. No. That's the. I don't believe it's feasible to to do at this point. I do think we're going to need to bite it off. I made a generally positive note that I appreciated the effort that you were going underground. We brought the neighbor. Where, where yeah, you could. I totally. And I, I recognize. Um, I recognize that that comes at an expense, um, <coughs> but that I, I think it also, you know, obviously there's aesthetic um, benefits, but from someone who works almost on a daily basis trying to get poles moved for one reason or another, um, sometimes very large, very large poles, um, that, that I just think it, it could, you know, it simplifies it from that standpoint um, until you get to the, you know, the point that you're talking about, which is when you, go, when you make that commitment, especially for underground ground three phase, you want to make sure that We'll get you, you enough distributed right generation in here that you won't have to worry about the load in here. So you can drop it down here and we'll be all right over here. We'll worry about that at the subdivision okay. of the other part. <laughs> Any uh, uh, board? Uh, any thoughts, comments on our just general level of comfort of keeping three phase above ground at this point on downs only, on downs road only? I understand it. It doesn't mean I'm comfortable. Okay. Just to be on record. Rachel, Roger, staff? Yeah, I'm fine on that. Okay. All right. Uh, other big topics? Covered space and bulk. Roadways, <coughs> conservation easement. 
Okay. As Jamel sort of flips through there, one question I had, um, and I appreciate the, uh, the update to sort of the, the um, mixed use or non-residential areas. The one thing I was starting to think about is given, again, sort of the, the, the range of permitted uses and the lot sizes, had, um, you know, might this be an opportunity to just sort of focus that in? What type of scale of development are you, any non-residential, I think we generally talked about be sort of neighborhood scale type stuff. And I just wonder if we want to really codify that. So again, that I, I think part of the part of the issues that um, questions that I've been receiving are, well, what happens down the road, right? Someone goes to the crossroads plan development district zone in our zoning book, and it says they can have, um, I don't know, um, What's that? A grocery, a grocery store. store. Or, uh, why, why wouldn't that be? So I just sort of wondered that this master plan process is an opportunity to really just sort of define what those permitted uses might be and give it a, a size or at least some type of intensity, sort of in a range. Like we did, I think Rachel asked a question about what do we mean by high, moderate, and low density? What do we mean by residential scale density? You know. Right now, we're talking about 5,000. There's no definition for that in the Right. And so, yeah. and again, it doesn't have to be, you know, locked down to the nth degree, but I think if we can build some additional language in the master plan document that sort of says, okay, you know, it'll, whether we, we talk about it in terms of traffic or building size or type, or, but just maybe, yeah. maybe just to find that a yeah. little yeah. bit further so that, again, when someone comes along, you know, down the road to buy the lot and says, great, I got a non-residential lot, I'm going to do one of these things that doesn't actually fit, we can point them back to the master plan and say, no, you know, these are the type of uses we're really talking about here. So, so do we do that now or do we do that as we do subdivisions? So I, I, think, I, I think, again, from in the master plan, it would be starting to codify or, or Put, put their parameters in place, and then I think... Um, we were, yeah, I mean, to answer yep. your question, we need to talk more about actual square footage. We were thinking a small office that would likely be on the first floor of a mixed-use building. Okay. Apartments, second, third floor, small office, maybe it's a real estate office, maybe it's, um, you know, another, a professional um, that lives in the neighborhood or wants to be have a business in the neighborhood. I'm thinking it's not more than five, you know, five thousand, so six thousand square feet max. Mm -hmm. Maybe if there's a coffee shop, that's probably two thousand square feet max. Um, those are the types of things. I mean, last meeting we didn't, we didn't really have that planned. We've added it because we think it's a good idea. If there's some potential. We don't know if there's a market, but we hope there is. So that's those are the uses that immediately come to mind. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I don't mean through the master plan to, that's right, we're, we're sitting here now in, you know, almost 2020, and we could be thinking about someone, you know, three to five years from now has a great idea, and, uh, you know, so I just think if the master plan can start to maybe expand on these general parameters so that we can, you know, um, not necessarily pin, our, pin ourselves into something in particular at the time, but at least there's something to point back to that when someone wants to come and do a big 20,000 square foot uh, fast food restaurant, I know drive throughs aren't allowed, but something to that effect, we could say, well, no, that, that wasn't the intent for this master plan. That was the intent for the downtown area. So, that, you know, yep. um, so. On the other hand, something like the table and tap down at those quarters as a neighborhood it restaurant fit. might be perfect. Might fit. Might yeah, fit. That, yep. that might fit. So we don't want to say, you know, no to a restaurant, but right. uh, we want to say some sort of size that gets, yeah. that people can perhaps come and say, well, you know, we need one more thousand square feet to make this work. But um, I, I think the emphasis that we, one emphasis to place on it is of serv is that it's a commercial operation that's of service to that community. And if you start to talk about it servicing that community, rather than a destination necessarily for, for other folks. Um, but I think a couple of things, 5,000 square feet is a good, a good max. As I look at the, um, I, can't, I think that's west. I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, 
the amount of land there, the amount of buildable area, really isn't conducive to something, to a bunch of things that are terribly large. Yeah. Right now, yeah. Well, and then we could give examples such as a small neighborhood restaurant, a coffee shop, a daycare center, a yoga studio. It would be difficult know. to fit within our, the street grid that we're establishing at this level. Anything that doesn't fit <laughs> yeah. the scale of the neighborhood, yeah. Yeah, just dimensionally, it, it wouldn't seem to work. So, so including that, <laughs> including that, the, the scale that, that, that fits in with the scale of the neighborhood also starts to eliminate 10, 15,000 square foot. Mm -hmm. Places. Yeah, um, won't this neighborhood be about ten minute a ten minute walk to the core, what you used to refer to as the Plus core? At the most. Plus at the most, five. right? And that's where you're gonna have like potential restaurants and things yeah. like that, shops and things like that, right? Yeah. Any other major issues? Your artist rendering with the car charger, I like that. Um, um, I'm good. All right. you guys so, I think we've tackled the major, major issues. I can open it up for any general comments. Uh, rolling up on two hours for anyone keeping track of time. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just ask. Go ahead, Roger. When, uh, when you were here before, I, didn't you indicate that you were going to do this? You were planning on building this out on two phases? It'll actually be more phases than that. More. Okay. So our, our intention would be to come, come back to you folks with a kind of a master subdivision, okay. create development areas, and then come back again when we know what the development in that area is, get that approved, and we'll move, there'll be other areas that we'll, that we'll move on to. So I think there's, there's a bunch of bites at the apple here as far as approvals go for the, for the planning board. Because uh, we, we need to we need to break it down into bite-sized pieces. And you, in your, your initial phases will be along the Downs Road area. Mm -hmm. Going yeah. up mm -hmm. towards where Right, that, that'll the, help us fund the infrastructure to build the Downs Road. We'll be on either side of that to start with. Exactly. Any other questions from board or even applicant at this point? Jen? Me. Jen's got a few. <laughs> Um, I've, I'm cro I've crossed a lot off, a lot off though, that's for sure. That's good. Um, just uh, um, another thank you for the, um, the, the planned active connectivity of this phase in particular. Um, I came here from a meeting, uh, unrelated, but through which we were just really struggling with um, the neighborhood that we, or, or parts of our community that were not um, given this sort of level of thoughtfulness when they were built out decades ago. Um, and and how, do we, how do we move forward with you know, neighborhoods that were not designed with trail connections, were not designed even for sidewalks, um, and certainly not for roads that included any type of bike lane or transit provisions or any on-street parking or any of that. Um, that it's, it's an uphill battle, and when, you have, when your neighborhood is fully built out to an extent where adding or changing the existing um, roadway or right-of-way like that, is, it, it's basically impossible. So from where we sit today on this day, um, I, I think we generally, we all feel that these are important, and so I hope they continue to be important in the, the decades ahead, um, but at the very least, planning for them feels like a good idea right now, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, and not just planning for them, but like continuing to really integrate them into these plans. So, you know, your comment about how that you know, the offshoot of that road was, was not intended to be sort of a primary vehicle route, but that maybe it has the potential to be a primary route in another way. Um, and you're, pro you're providing for that um, connectivity. I, just, I'm, I think future, future generations will benefit from that. Um, I have a couple of questions about 
the DOT process that you are undergoing, and, um, and they're, they're mostly questions generally. Um, without, uh, I, I'm curious if there's any guess at this point, I'm sure it's a guess, but uh, at what point we might start to see or be talking about offsite mitigation, and if so, how far out, uh, like li linearly, distance-wise, are you looking? Sure. Um, the term linear area wide beyond <coughs> our intersections. Um, in terms of off site mitigation, uh, that's going to happen soonest. It's going to be a connection heights parkway. Um, it's you know, the, the development of the town center. So from a uh, chronological <laughs> linear fashion um, that'll likely be made um, as sort of a major form of mitigation and activity um, with the new road out to Heights Parkway and the Redwood City intersection improvements. Um, and um, depending on the quantity developed up by Payne Road um, and then how quickly the Nation District builds out, then whether there's other uses up, up there, then that intersection will be further improved. Um, and the pain road between that intersection and exit 42 will need some expansion. Um, route 1 at some point needs some improvement beyond the signals need sort of improvement, like the equipment there probably needs improvement sooner, but from a capacity standpoint, actually it has a lot of capacity. So it's not like that needs imminent major improvements. Um, and we've been working with the Turnpike Authority as to what's necessary to exit 42 that relates to this project. Um, beyond that, through the DOT process, we're in the middle of it. So like we're looking at how far out are we studying and beyond impact fees, what are those other things? So. We don't. We aren't at a place yet where there's um, issues or improvements far out that are assigned to this project and then the timelines. So that, I think that'll bear itself out in the course of the next. But they're looking months. at two miles out. They're right? looking at. They're studying two miles out. That doesn't mean mitigation is assigned two miles out. Sure. Um, so that's a TBD in terms of. Other things. We continue on the transit thing to work with those agencies um, for opportunities. But that's a longer play. You know? um, so, but that's still an active conversation. Thank you for segueing into my next question, okay. which is about whether or not there's any um, current monitoring going <coughs> on in terms of uh, trips or traffic associated with the phase one build out um, in general and then more specifically about any activity that and this could be purely anecdotal the last part of this question but um, just whether or not you've seen anyone that's living there now using the, um, the trail network sidewalks trans is there bus r running through there now do you have any knowledge of the usage of that yet either um, sidewalk use is high um, I don't, I don't spend weekends there, so I don't know a lot about the trail use. <laughs> um, I, but I think there's a fair amount of activity. You probably know better, Rocky. On yeah, that. No, it's, it's, it's pretty well used. And, and to, just to back up for phase one for a minute, we'll have, uh, I believe by Christmas, all but three or four of the condominiums will be fully occupied. And I think there are about six houses that will spill over into early January. Occupied, so we're we're pretty close to fully occupied, and, and I would say in my experience, the sidewalk system, the trail system, is getting used. Um, I don't know if anybody's using the bus. The bus is there every day, um, but I don't have experience as to whether or not it's getting used. We can, I uh, should zoom a follow up on things so I can inquire with them. Just I'm just inquire with them. We can also inquire at least with. 
pretty easily check with our uh, our <coughs> poverty residents and our condominium residents. Just to, I can I can get somebody to send a questionnaire on this to be answered right now. And I think there's increasing opportunity with independent senior too coming sure. online for that. Kevin's project. Kevin's project. Um, we interested in less in. kind of auto dependent folks. What if one was a memory, is there a memory care in there? A memory care facility that's under construction right now. It's okay. not off right Okay. So that'll be May-ish. Yeah. Not that they're going to make those requests. Right no, they're, 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 not they're not riding the bus or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> they have their own bus. They actually have a... They have their own bus. Um, and the only other thing, the only other note that I had, and it's very specific, and I just barely forgot about it from earlier, but back to the topic of um, setbacks. Um, I think the so the comment was made about having a minimum setback of 20 feet from the garage space to the sidewalk, um, and based on some of the you know preliminary sketches anyway, it generally looks like the thought is that a, the sidewalk network here would continue to be a consistent distance from the gutter line. But the, if there's any place where you might run into the issue of having a garage space and sort of a uh, a driveway with a sidewalk that's set back further from the road that might feel like a place where somebody could stack a second car and then um, just be a little deeper but um, so just being mind mindful of that I, certainly the, the nod to uh, being mindful of not having private parking activity blocking that part of the public network um, it's good just want to make sure that's uh, relevant for that was one of those anywhere. things we picked up with with, uh, actually, I learned it when we were doing our project over in Westbrook, and then really with phase one, um, you, know, you don't want those cars blocking that sidewalk. Yeah. And so, but, but when you think about that, that's really only where we have front load garages, sure. right. which is not going to be everywhere right. in this. You know, we're going to have a handful of those situations. So we need to be really mindful of how we set those houses and how we set those sidewalks so that people are going to park in the driveway. You only have 14 feet and on a block of the sidewalk. So 20 feels. I think I think in phase one, the shortest distance we have, and Jay, I don't know if you remember, I think may, we might be at 18 on some of them. Um, but I think we felt like 20 was the, was the right number to shoot for. But we had to do some jockeying in phase one with, with, the, with the sidewalk in a few places. Sure. You know, it was going to be here, we pulled it back a little bit. So we it was a much more constrained site. It was overall. a much more constrained site. Right. Can I, I, just a general question. When you build garages, is there a standard size that you build, like say it's a, a two-star garage, is there a standard, like a minimum size that you would build? And the reason if I I'm building it, it, it needs a two-car <laughs> garage is 24 by 24. Okay, because I, I happen to know somebody who moved into a new house and they can barely fit their two cars in the garage. Uh, and I thought that was kind of, I mean, I, I suspect most people don't have any idea about that. They never think about that, you know? It's typically, you know, a lot of builders will call a 22 foot wide garage, a two car garage, 22 by 22. And we've got some, and we'll build some that yeah. way. And, yeah. But you won't hear me say, hey, you've got a two car garage. It's a garage and a half. <laughs> it's a place to keep car the motorcycle. car in the lawnmower. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. all it is. Uh, really, oh, 24 by 24 is the right, is a two cut. And that's a standard in, basically, in the industry for the most part? It's my standard. Okay. It was my dad's standard. So. Any other? Yeah. General? As, as general, then? I'm all done, yes. I, I just have a general question, Rocky. On, um, on page 12 of this, this thing here, mm -hmm. you show the general layout of the whole place. When you start to work on this uh, town center residential district and you start to reroute Downs Road, uh, yes, I, what, what's going to happen to the existing road that basically goes straight? So, is that going to remain there because the Downs is still going to be essentially operating for a couple of years? So the down, the plan is to operate the Downs for a couple more years. Okay. Uh -huh. There'll always be a connective, you'll always be able to get from Route 1 to Payne Road. Yes. We'll have to reroute that as, as we go. But there's a there's a pretty good section uh, that goes away in between some wetland. I don't know if I can. Uh, is it right there? I, don't want, I, I think I can show you. Right now, you know, the Downs Road comes in like this, 
and then it kind of comes down. Well, it goes down. It's the red line. Along. It's, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's the red line. <laughs> it comes here. The red line is existing <laughs> down the road, right? Yes. Hey, it's late. <laughs> um, so this section of the road will go away, and this our plan is to be able to knit that wetland back together. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but this road gets gets built out and then gets rerouted. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but right, a lot of road. this section of road goes away, gets yeah. rerouted over here. This goes away, doesn't get replaced because you're going to come down and then you're going to come up. You can come into into Center Street, and come out here, and then you basically have um, Center Street in the Innovation District coming down into the Parkway. Mm -hmm. That, right. That's your vision. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the two of me. Yeah. yeah. Right. This is already there. Now. Yeah. So exactly. with the Downs Road, you know, the Downs Road goes from Route One to Payne. Yeah. The Downs Road's going to stop. Right. It's going to hit Center Street. Yeah. This will have to get renamed at some point. I don't know what that'll be, yeah. but figure that out when we get there. But it's so right. as we're moving through the project, you'll always be able to get you from Route One. Pain. Okay. In some so, so when you start this residential development, you're not going to reroute the whole down the road. No. You're just going to go. We're going to match back back time. Time. Like yep. We'll keep matching back onto the existing yeah. road until we get to the point where it's it's, it's all done. It's all rebuilt. Any other questions from the board? Staff, good. Applicant, good. Get a thumbs up. We are gonna see you next time. I'm gonna clean it up a little. Okay. And hopefully it will be a quick since we invested a good amount of time in discussion on this tonight. I think uh, yeah, I that's ask. my sentiment. Other board members of course are free to disagree. Uh, can we do it as part of a regular meeting or do we need to work out? Yes. Okay, that, so it'd be part of a regular meeting. I think you can. Yeah. So so basically we're talking about clarification. I think, I think that's what there's I mean there's some other little stuff that I think will work out but I think the bulk of space the bulk of space needs to be at a written level of comfort for both parties so so essentially it'd just be considered a returning application for submission purposes yeah. basically that makes sense to everyone That said, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> is there a second? All in favor. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yes, thanks. That looks good. Yeah.